Good morning world. Today I am present before you with Chaucer's Art of Portraiture with special reference to his work Prologue to the Canterbury Tales. Before I begin the podcast, it is advisable that you keep a notebook and a pen so that you can jot down the important points relating to this particular topic. It is further advisable to use earplugs for listening to the podcast. So here I begin. In the Canterbury Tales, no individual isolated portrait is to be found. Chaucer does not paint his personages in miniature. He arranges them in groups in such a way that each may set off the other. It would be quite a mistake to attempt examining them one by one. They can be properly understood even as individuals. Only by studying their mutual interconnections. It is not in this or that trait or gesture that the poet's true forte lies. It is in the management of the whole. Before providing to the portraits themselves, it is advisable to examine the frames they have to fill. Chaucer's intention was that the work as a whole should start from a prologue, in which the poet in person would supply the data and furnish the indispensable information about the narrators to move on to an epilogue, in which he would reappear to met out to each his due and unravel the threads of interwoven intrigue. Between starting point and goal, the course was to run not in a straight line, but in ever-renewed spirals. The work of inner construction was to start afresh at each articulation of the poem. These articulations were to be marked by the narrator's prologues, which to avoid confusion in terms I should prefer to call the interludes. Here the poet was to keep more or less in the background so as to allow the pilgrims themselves to settle the order of the tales. Lastly, each of the tales was to set off saliently on the flat surface of the whole, the individuality of a narrator accordingly as his character was holy or profane, solemn or laughable, chivalrous or facetious. The main point is that he drew them and drew them with a very firm hand. To the three phases the work repeatedly passes through prologue, interludes, tales, correspond three modes of presentation which taken together make up the complete portrait. They are the portrait of description, the portrait by dialogue and the portrait by monologue. The characters are outlined in the prologue, evolve in the interludes and become fixed in the tales. In the general introduction, the poet depicts the traits that never vary in the interludes, he watches for changes of countenance, marks the gestures, records the tone of the altercations. Lastly, in the tales that are told on the way, he leaves each narrator to reveal the dominant preoccupation of his soul. Each detail can be elaborated without detriment to the perspective. By the coordination of these divisions, it slowly develops each individual, showing first his exterior and only discussing his soul by degrees. Hence, continuity of interest is at no time interrupted. Like a discreet artist, he disappears as much as possible behind his personages. He attempts only to set one over against the other expecting they will be able to complete each other later. In the prologue, where he speaks in person, almost the sole duty he reserves for himself is that of describing figure, costume and social rank, because they are things that would be difficult to explain in dialogue. He has only known his personages one day. 
he tells us and with his usual tact he takes care not to give us too detailed information concerning them we need not be alarmed by the superficiality it is merely an artistic device of that delightful pseudo forgive chaucer he was from first to last trying to present this delight through his characters chaucer claimed to be an observer not a psychologist at every moment however there occur in the prologue touches that for show with which or what is he will be able to assume another part it is in his capacity of dramatic observer that he'll reappear in the interludes it is not inconsiderately that chaucer has assembled his 29 pilgrims nor is it inconsiderately either that he distributes them in sets he knows the picturesque effect produced by contrast and juxtaposition of colors he knows that in the jumble the brilliant embroideries of the squire for example stand out only on the dark green background of his companion and servant the yeoman in the moral sphere he knows also how important it is to throw into relief the disinterestedness the courtesy of the knight and his son on the simpering hypocrisy and cupidity of the religious orders or again to contrast the latter with the surly and threatening masses of the people it is far more delicate matter to preserve artistic unity amid the jostling of personages of every sort than to trace out the great motionless divisions of the prologue the balance of classes is upset it is necessary continually to adjust the balance between individuals each one must develop while developing his neighbor so the two which best complete each other must be brought into contact now besides that the choice of the complementary colors is fairly difficult to this first problem is super added that of arranging the groups thus formed it has been said that chaucer's art oscillates between the knightly ideal and popular realism chaucer does not call attention directly to conflicts between ideals and classes but to quarrels between individuals for it is the only way of restoring without apparent effort the equilibrium he seeks chaucer reduces his own part to that of a disinterested chronicler causing his personages to act solely through their tones and gestures he manages to order the complex and swarming throng of the interludes with the same clarity of exposition the same balance of parts as he had applied to the motionless masses of the prologue the body of the interludes forms a pendant to the prologue the new requirement is that the body of the tales should form a pendant to the interludes the one shows the personages at rest the other in action the third must enlighten us concerning their inmost soul the portraits without becoming untrue acquire a relief that the poet could not as an impartial observer have given them directly each of them wants to make his discourse bear fruit he opens his mouth only to extol the merits of his particular caste to declare war on the surrounding castes to flatter a friend to damage a foe or simply to enjoy the triumph of a general ovation chaucer's real art is negative rather than positive it is not in the direct portrait that it must be sought but in the portrait by contrast by antiphrases by implication the art lies less in the stores he accumulates than in the manner in which he distributes and condenses them for in his eyes A really rich art is not that which lavishes details but that which from a single detail causes light to flash on all sides chaucer has not always a very handsome stone in his hands but he always excels in cutting it on all its faces so that 
there shall be intercrossing reverberation and dazzle of light so this was all about the art of portraiture by chaucer with special reference to prologue to the canterbury tales i hope the podcast proved to be of help to each one of you please mention your observations and questions in the comment section below please like share and subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click on the bell icon for latest update thank you for your valuable time here's wishing you a great day ahead thank you